we'll begin uh, with something that's a, a different topic from the ones we've discussed in uh, previous times. Uh, the issue of wearing a talit while praying. Now, uh, in, the, in the language of the sages, talit sometimes refers to any type of cloak or uh, other such garment. We are used to nowadays referring, uh, we're used to the fact that a talit often refers to a traditional prayer shawl, usually with sisit on it. That's the, the normal way we understand it. And uh, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the general one that is uh, specifically there to have four corners and uh, the ritual strings that the Torah commands, uh, hopefully gone also with Tzacheleth, that's the way it's supposed to be. So uh, let, let's speak about it. Uh, the general thesis of what we're saying tonight is that uh, perhaps everyone all the time when praying should do so. Uh, we'll have a little bit of surprise also. What does this have to do with, let's say, women? Uh, a court will start with, uh, we'll start that teaser with uh, noting that it seems from the simple uh, Maimonidean understanding, the relevant halachot, that women are obligated to pray just as men are. What does that mean? It doesn't talk about Kriyat Shema with its brachas. It uh, means that uh, one has to say the Shema and Asri, certainly uh, Shaharith and Minha. It so happens that, historically speaking, women, for whatever reason, did not do so. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, we, for whatever reason, uh, women hadn't done that, so you could find many, uh, let's say, after the fact, justifications, arguments uh, for why women do not pray as often as men in classical Jewish circles. But like I said, perhaps it's time that women uh, did uh, once again become used to praying regularly, certainly Shahrith, Mincha, Musaf, etc. For Arvith, maybe you could have more of an argument against it, although I would say that maybe even for, from a strictly Maimonidean perspective and uh, other such Rishonim and Gonim, uh, women are just as obligated to Shimon Esrei as are the men. So let's begin here. It says uh, in the fifth parak of the Choth Tefillah, we have uh, a number of standards uh, Rambam mentions. Uh, he mentions that one has to be dressed properly. Uh, his first standards in this fifth chapter are, uh, I guess, minimum. And he calls me'akev. That is, if one does not have them, then one should not be praying. Uh, for example, last time we were talking about prostration during prayer. That was in the next chapter. That was talking about things that uh, one should do while praying, but uh, if he can't, then he can't. One of the things that he has to have is tikkun hamabush. What is tikkun hamabush? He says that he has to be dressed properly. He has to make himself look presentable uh, based on this pasuk. And one of the standards he says is that a person should not be wearing his work apron. Think of a blacksmith and other such professions. They would wear their work clothes to protect themselves and perhaps their nicer clothes. So one should not pray while wearing those type of clothes. And he also says one should not pray uh, with his head bare. Um, notice that the Rambam does not say that it's forbidden for one to have his head bare. Or it's forbidden for one person to walk around. The assumption here is that during the day, men, of course, can walk around with their head bare. It's just not proper for them to have their heads bare uh, when they are praying. And the Vilna Gon uses this as one of the proofs for his position against what later uh, decisors would write, that one should uh, always have his head covered, at least with a kippah, with a yarmulke. Uh, and there are those who say yeah, it's a, almost a, a, a strict a strict prohibition to be bareheaded, and it's a strict obligation to have one's hair covered or head covered, except then we have to think, well, if this was such a terrible prohibition, why aren't women obligated also? Uh, so there is no answer, really. Technically speaking, like the Villagon points out, you never have to have your head covered, except it's proper to do so when you are praying and studying. And people who are holy should cover their heads all the time. But the rest of us have no such uh, have no such obligation. And uh, Avi, is your headband well, is like a bandana? Your headband, you say like a bandana, bandana. Any anything you wear on your head, we'll we'll save questions for later. Anything anything that you use to cover your head, the whole idea of let's say the skull cap that I'm wearing here is. Really, I'd want to wear a hat as a sign of Yari Malka. I'm aware of God's presence and I show my fear of his 
of fear of him, but it might be inconvenient to wear a hat. So we basically created a minimal hat. And that's what a yarmulke is. It's just a convenient token symbolic hat. Uh, let's go back into the, the topic at hand. Here he says a whole bunch of no's basically. Don't do this and don't do that. And then he says positively, uh, it is the way of the sages and those who aspire to be like them uh, that they only pray when they are atufin. Atufin literally means enwrapped. So what I could say that this means they're wearing certain types of cloaks or perhaps they're wearing turbans, something to wrap their head. To understand what he's referring to, we look in the laws of Tzitzit, uh, the third chapter, uh, sometimes some some uh, ways of numbering it have it the twelfth halacha. Some have it as the 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 eleventh halacha. He talks about how a person should wear tzitzit. What's the point? Uh, even though a person uh, is under no obligation to purchase himself a talit and then wrap himself with it in order to fulfill the mitzvah of tzitzit, it seems that tzitzit is a conditional commandment. If he's wearing a four corner garment, then he has to attach these tassels. But if he doesn't have uh, occasion to wear such a garment, then he has no occasion to perform this commandment. Uh, really, it's not proper. A person should always try to have some tzitzit on uh, so they can fulfill this commandment. And then the Rambam says, if you shot at filat, is a tear. When one prays, it's even more important to make sure that one has tzitzit. It's a big disgrace for someone who aspires to be like the sages, a talmid of the chachamim, shayt palel v'hu atuf, that he prays and he is not enwrapped. So Rambam's talking about the mitzvah tzitzis. He says it's really important that, a, that someone who's trying to be like the sages uh, is wearing his tzitzit, and he equates that. He, he should pray when he is atuf, atuf mitzitzit. And you've probably seen the shoresh, lehit atef basisith, is the blessing said thereon. So in the Rambam over here, where I'm highlighting, in the laws of tefillah say that it's the way of the chachamim and their, uh, their pupils, that they only pray when they're atufi, means they only pray when they have their uh, talitot in which to unwrap themselves. Very simply, uh, the Rambam is saying one should wear uh, his talit in which to unwrap himself every single prayer. And uh, there is no distinction here, by the way. Rambam gives these halachot. He is not distinguishing between, let's say, shaharith and arvith or mincha. Uh, all the prayers have the same status. So in the Maimonidean way of looking at this, one should... Uh, and wrap himself with a talith, with proper tzitzit for every prayer. And also, uh, it apparently means when he says that one should wrap himself, not any hat or turban will do. It has to specifically be the type of talith that the Jews wear that has tzitzit. The tour, interestingly enough, leaves out what the Rambam says. But the Beis Yosef, uh, Beis Yosef itself is a, is a commentary on the tour. It's uh, or I would like to say it's the it's the longer version of the Shulchan Aruch. It's the notes that uh, Rabbi Yosef Karo had on the tour, uh, bring up various points and uh, sourcing what the tour said, or bring up uh, perhaps disputes among classical authorities. He leaves this out, but the Beit Yosef in, in does include it. It's an Orachaim Mark ninety one, and this is the text of the Shulchan Aruch there, uh, which he wrote based on the tour. He says Lo liyamod bafundato. That's what the Rambam said over here. The person should not pray wearing his work apron. And they threw in how they used to say that in uh, some foreign language. Taksa, okay, I guess, I don't know, is that, is that Yiddish? Someone could correct me. Vilo birosh migule, not with his head exposed, etc. Unless, you know, the style and not with short pants. Uh, here it says, it doesn't say short pants. He means with his legs exposed, unless that's, you know, uh, perhaps, like they said, that's the way they do it on the farm, so everybody does that. The Rambam mentioned this also. And then he quotes the Rambam over here. Uh, and when the, the only difference is here it's with the Memsofit, here it's with the Nunsofit. We always thought the, the Beit Yosef, the Maran, in uh, his commentary was bringing this from the Rambam. He attributes this line to the Rambam. So when he attaches it to the Shulchan Aruch over here in Orachayim, he is meaning it the way the Rambam meant it. That is, uh, he's telling people that it's proper to wear a talit uh, with which to unwrap oneself during prayer. And once again, no distinction is made between the various uh, times of prayer. Not, it doesn't matter if it's shacharit or mincha or arvit or perhaps the additional prayers like musaf and ilah. And once again, he is certainly not talking about 
for example, uh, using something in, in place of the talith, perhaps uh, if we we're talking about unwrapping the head, let's say some sort of hat or turban. There's a classical Mishnah Brewer here, which, which uh, comments on something early in the Shulchan Aruch about not praying with one's head exposed. And that's where he uh, reasons, I'll read this out loud, this is a Mishnah Brewer over there, Nowadays, our times, remember the, the, the Chavetz Chaim uh, writing this, lived in Radin around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, this is Poland before World War I. He writes that a person should be wearing a hat uh, on his head. He should wear his outdoor hat, the kind he wears when he walks in the street, and not the little hat that he wears underneath that hat. He's referring to the little hat is this thing, the yarmulke, which by the way, if you look at classic pictures of the Chavetz Chaim, seem to have been quite big. And then he has the even bigger hat that he's wearing in the street. Ki ein derech lamod kein lifnei anashim chashvim kol shekein shluf mitz. It's not proper to just wear yarmulke in front of important personages. And uh, of course, one shouldn't wear his sleep hat. Shluf mitz is sleep hat. Shluf is sleep in Yiddish and mitz is a hat. Uh, Mitzin would be hats in Yiddish. So what the Mishnah Burr here is saying, that he argued that because the style at the time was to wear a hat, like, of course, who wouldn't wear a hat? How could you go out without a hat? And you have to wear one during prayer. But he's not saying this. He didn't add this comment over here to what the Shulchan Aruch says about being a tufim. The hat is not a replacement for the talit. The hat is basically his yarmulke at prayer. And of course, uh, this basically means that nowadays the hat is redundant. Uh, see, right here. This hat is a redundancy because nowadays people don't wear that. Adarabah, it's only Jews who wear it because they think they have to wear it for prayer. But the only reason they have to wear it for prayer is because, of course, you, would, you wouldn't walk around without one in the street. I remember uh, this happened twice, uh, uh, almost uh, one, once 15 years ago and once 17 years ago. 17 years ago in New York, uh, I think it was the, it was the, uh, not the, it's not the Kretschner of February, the, the, the Rebbe goes around, there's, a, there's actually two of them. One of them lived in B'nai Brak. He passed away recently. He never had a beard because the Germans, Yomach Shemam, ripped it off of him. Oh, I forget. And there's another one, his, his New York counterpart, his Chutzlar's counterpart, who also would speak a lot of times in Israel. So he came to visit in the yeshiva. And the Rosh Yeshiva and the rest of the faculty went out to the street to greet him. And I quickly told one of the younger buckers, quick, run and put on your hat because we're greeting an important personage. Even the Rosh Hashiva wasn't wearing his, his Hamburg, which he normally had. He wasn't wearing his hat at all. None of the, the faculty had their hats, even though they did own hats, and they had them conveniently. And the younger Bachar asked me, why? why should I put on my hat? I said, because if you don't put on your hat to greet the Rebbe, then we will have no reason to wear the hat at prayer. And we want to have a reason to wear hats at prayer. I was, I was uh, trying to make a point. I, I did not always wear a hat at prayer. I barely did. I barely owned one. And uh, the same thing happened when another... A uh, prominent Rebbe came to visit our yeshiva back in 2007, and I told one of the uh, one of the Ramim's sons. He had a 15 year old son there at the time. I told him, "Quick, get your hat in order to greet the Rebbe." Why? Because if you do not put on your hat when we come to greet the Rebbe, then we will have no actual reason to wear our hats when we pray. So, yeah, you can see what the Mishnah Burr is saying. It's quite clear. The Mishnah Burr is not commenting here that this is somehow an achievement uh, that one is accomplishing atifa with such a hat. Uh, so we see here, at least, the Shulchan Aruch falls the Rambam, one should wear his talith at all prayers. And lest one think that this is just, okay, so that's Rambam and Shulchan Aruch. Yes, those are the two major codes we follow. The Aruch HaShulchan uh, makes this point explicit in two places. He says here, uh, right in the beginning of Siman Chet, where it talks about uh, the proper dress, uh, he says here, uh, and he's talking about how to wear it tzitzit also, he throws in this line, All B'nai Yisrael wear a talit katan. Uh, talit, by the way, is a feminine word. It's been pointed out by Rav Mazuz and others. It should be talit katana. It's Yiddish. Because in Yiddish, we call this a talis. So you don't really recognize the fact that such a word sounds feminine in Yiddish. So the we use a masculine uh, adjective over here, even though ideally true here, which should be talit katana. Uh, the talit gadol beirat and one should wear a larger talith, our traditional talith, when he prays. And once again, no distinction is made between the prayers. And also, no distinction here is made in these classical sources 
about, let's say, people not wearing a talif because they haven't yet come of age or have gotten married. Uh, on the contrary, the Shulchan Aruch follows uh, the Rambam and others who say that it is a father's obligation to teach his son to keep the commandments. And as soon as he could wear a tzitzit properly, including a talik adol, his father should get him one so that he can train himself, this child, to wear, wear tzitzit properly. And uh, perhaps we've seen in certain societies where men, for whatever reason, don't get their own talik adol, uh, their own personal one, before they get married, even though when called for, they borrow one or they have a few extra in the shul. Uh, this is a, a practice that uh, many of the classic post commit have been left uh, figuratively scratching their heads about. The Mishnah Bura has pointed out that it doesn't really make much sense. Why should a person not fulfill this commandment and these obvious halachas just because he has yet to get married? It's a avera gorera savera. So many have uh, don't have such a practice, and many who grew up with such a thing. Rabbi Salvechik, uh, classically, I think he, they, he told his son, uh, who unfortunately never got married, but still, but, well, was still relevant. Uh, that he should train himself to wear a talit. And I remember being surprised seeing, let's say, other boys when I was growing up. Oh, they already had a talit. Yes, it wasn't. It shouldn't have surprised me. Perhaps it's the better thing to train them. And uh, certainly in Eretz Royal, uh, more young men acquire talitoth even before their bar mitzvah so they could train in it. And those who have more of a reason to wear it, we know Kwanim always have to have a talit convenient because thank God they do more commandments here. They always utter the priestly benediction. So they need a talit also. So this mitzvah has made a comeback. You don't find it in these classic sources. The Archa Shulchan was as litvish as they come. The Mishnah Brewer was as litvish as they come. They're, they're basically the two rival Svarim, 20th century poskim there. Uh, they both seem to say that everybody should wear a talith at all prayers. No distinction between married, unmarried, or even children. The children are trained to do it, and by the time they're permitted, they should do so. He says here also in Siman Kaf Dalid, uh, he mentions this thing. He says over here, He's talking about the number of the knots. He wears a talit gadol at the time of prayer on top of all his other garments so he could see his tzitzit. Once again, that's a time of prayer uh, and there's no distinction made. So we see here, we'll conclude this thesis by saying, yes, uh, a person should aspire just like it is good to wear tefillin uh, all day long or as much as possible during the day because that is a commandment that God gave us and he wanted us to walk around with tefillin. That's the sign. Uh, that is the, the, the sign of the covenant. So too, it is proper that Jewish people, uh, especially Jewish men, keep the commandment of tzitzit and especially during prayer. So they should have their tali there. Unfortunately, what are you going to do? Some places they look askance at you. Uh, I know where I come from, it's either you, can't, you cannot wear a tali at mincha, even the chazan can't, Yet there are those, uh, Alpi Kabbalah have brought it back. And you go to one minion, thank God, here you see the rabbi and others, they're wearing their talitoth at least at Mincha every day. And I'm surprised for some reason there's Alpi Kabbalah, even though, yes, they do take off their tefillin before the sun sets, they also take off their talit, which doesn't really make much sense because once one is already wearing his talit at Mincha, keep it on for RV. Uh, we see that, for example, uh, on Yom Kippur, everybody wears a talit, thank God, at Mincha. And then uh, they might as well keep it on for the Motzei Yom Tov Arvith. That's fine. Why do they take it off for Arvith? I don't know. Uh, this past fast day also was surprised. Other people had their uh, talit and tefillin on at Mincha. As, as the day came to an end, we took off our tefillin, uh, but everybody else also took off their talit, and I kept mine on at Arvith. It's important to teach people. If you have your, your prayer shawl, keep it on for all your prayers. Uh, let's talk about a little bit of Shabbat. Uh, God willing, this Shabbos, many of us will be getting together. There's the Machon Shilo Shabbaton. Uh, we hope to see you there. And uh, we're going to bring up this issue. Perhaps a talith is even more important to wear on Shabbat. It's uh, part of the Kibbut Shabbat, sometimes mi uh, mispronounced, uh, mispronounced as mispronounced. I mispronounced the word mispronounced. Uh, sometimes it's pronounced Kavod Shabbat. No, it's Kibbut Shabbat because it's the act. It's the act of... Uh, of showing reverence to the Sabbath. Uh, Rambam says here, and towards the end of Hilchot Shabbat, he says, Ezehu Kibud. How does one show Kibud Shabbat? There's Oneg or Inug. Uh, Oneg is the noun. Kibud is the way, uh, Inug is the way you enjoy Shabbos. He says, what's the Kibud? That's what you do beforehand. 
זה שמרו חכמים שמצווה אדם לרחוץ פניו ידיו ורגליו וחמים בערב שבת. This is the commandment that right before the Sabbath one should wash his hands, uh, face and feet with warm water uh, out of uh, respect for the Sabbath. And then once he's done washing up, ideally you should, the Rambam says he should wash himself his whole body. The problem is, uh, in the olden days they didn't have showers and convenient places to bathe, men going to the bathhouse on Friday. So they went to the bathhouse, let's say early Friday afternoon, and then shortly before Shabbos, they rewashed their hands, uh, face and, and feet. And then he says, Specifically, he enwraps himself in tzitzit, he should sit in, uh, with gravitas, uh, and hoping to receive, uh, no, sorry, hoping to receive the divine countenance and the, 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 the face of the Sabbath. Yeah, to him, the Sabbath is, is masculine, he says, Shabbat HaMelech over here. So he's going out to greet the king. Uh, the sages used to gather their Talmudim on Erev Shabbos in order to greet the Sabbath, and and they'd all put on their, their Talitot. And they would say, We're familiar with Shabbat HaMalka, uh, the Sabbath queen. Here it's the Sabbath king. Okay. Uh, Sabbath queen is more of a Kabbalistic uh, uh, way of understanding it. So you see here, the Rambam saying, the, the kibbutz of Shabbat is to wash up and to put on one's tzitzit. It seems from the Vilna Gon that one should always have a change of clothes for the Sabbath. Mi kaf regel ve'adrosh, from the soles of his feet to his head. That is, he should have special shoes for Shabbos and of course, special pants, whatever it is they, that we wear. Pants are sort of a new thing. And even a special headgear for Shabbos, a different yarmulke, if hats are his thing, so she'd have a specifically different type of hat for Shabbos. And of course, a different talit. So they put on their Shabbat talit. And this is based on a teaching in the 25th page of Masechet Shabbat. Here, uh, Rava was telling Abayi that it was his belief that uh, it is, it's obligatory to light Shabbos candles. Some could have said, well, I don't need Shabbos candles. I need the dark. No, it's an obligation. By the way, this became even a greater obligation. It seems that the blessing we recite on uh, lighting the Shabbos candles Dates to around the, is is to uh, repudiate the opinion of the Sadducees and later the Karaites, who felt that one cannot have any fire burning in his house before Sabbath. So if one had fire going or some candles burning his house as the Sabbath would come in, which by the way they would start in the morning. Remember, to them uh, a day starts with sunrise and not with sunset. They would blow out all the candles and they would then sit in the dark on Saturday night uh, because they couldn't light any new candles. That's a, that was a sign that they were. Uh, non-believers and the sages and the, and the oral law. So we actually light candles and say a blessing on them in order to repudiate them. And it says here that there's a mitzvah. It says some, some people felt, uh, Rava was saying, that washing one's hands, legs, uh, sorry, just hands, he says, he doesn't mention the face. He just says the hands and, and feet in the warm water uh, as Shabbos is, is coming in is... Uh, Rashuth, it's an optional mitzvah. And he says, no, I think it's an actual mitzvah, as in a commandment uh, or obligatory. Here he says obligatory, so must hear it's an actual mitzvah to do so. Uh, what does he mean by a mitzvah? So they say in uh, that the practice of Rabbi Yudu Bar Yilai would be that on Erev Shabbos, they would bring him an Ariva full of hot water, means a trough of hot water. He would wash his hands, uh, face, and feet. And umitatef, and he put on his his tzitzit. Vyoshevus edin matzuyatzin. Matzuyatzin means with tzitzit on them. He would enwrap himself in what looked like to everybody else a sheet. It wasn't a traditional talit or a cloak. It looked like a sheet, but it had tzitzit, and that's what he'd wear for Shabbos. And he looked like one of God's angels. But his talmidim would hide the edges of their own garments. They wanted to hide their tzitzit from him. They were looking at him, the fact that he's wearing, let's say, it looks like a bedsheet. And he's saying, yeah, but Beit Shammai are the ones who say that one does not need to have tzitzit and such a thing. But Beit Hill are the ones who do obligate such a garment. So, you know, that's why I'm wearing this thing. It might look like a bedsheet, but uh, Beit Hill, I'll say it has to have tzitzit in it. And uh, the halacha follows Beit Hillel. And his Talmidim, it says here, Inu Savrei, they felt that such a thing looked so much like a bedsheet. It was basically a blanket. And 
the general uh, view is uh, this could be a, another upcoming shear. Something that's suit lila, a blanket basically, should not have seat seat, even though blankets generally have four four corners. So that's why the, the students didn't want to show them what they were doing. Uh, because they disagreed with the Rebbe, they felt that you know perhaps he was a little bit too extreme with putting seat seat in such a thing. Uh, so this is brought also in Shulchan Aruch, that one should put on his tzitzit as Shabbos is coming in. He says here, as Shabbos is coming in, Yobash Gadav Hanaim, he should wear his nice clothes. He smacked the Viyat Shabbat. He should be happy with the approach of the Sabbath. Uh, as one goes out to greet the king. Someone going out to greet the bride and groom. The Rabbi Chaninam Yatef. This is mentioned later in Shabbos and Daf Kuf Yutet. He would also once again, enwrap himself. And it was just seen when, when they use this word, it doesn't just mean put on a turban or put on a cloak. It means put on a talit. He would stand in the corner as a, as the, the Sabbath was coming in. Let's go out and greet the Sabbath queen. Uh, so you see here, uh, we have two Talmudic sources that are actually brought in uh, the Shulchan Aruch and the Rambam once again, that the way to properly respect the Sabbath, the definition, according to the Rambam, of kibbutz Shabbat is washing up and then putting on Shabbos clothes, including the talith. So I tried to do this for a while. I've only seen some places where you know, some Yemenites and others, they put on what's obviously a talith as part of their uh, Sabbath getup. And really, sometimes you can't, it's inconvenient or it's, the suit looks nicer. So what I did was I got myself a very large talith katan. Uh, much larger than the minimum shear. Remember, it has to be a, like a meter and whatever it is. You know, the rabbi had a shear about that. So I got myself a very large talith katan to put on uh, as the Sabbath is coming in. And that's the one I wear all of Sabbath. And, and I also have another talith kodol I wear most of the Sabbath, and I try to keep it there because it seems here that that's the very definition of how to uh, dress and honor the Sabbath. And if you, uh, some people say, yeah, but we don't do that anymore. Uh, and therefore you shouldn't wear a talus. I remember speaking to, uh, this is one of the two things I learned from Avi Weiss, who uh, wasn't exactly an hour based medrash, but was a very inspirational because he was really committed to what he did. And he stood up for Ami Yisrael, especially those stuck behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, we need more Jews like that, who are able, you know, activists for the sake of other Jews. And when I went to HIR for the Yachad Shabbatons those years, I saw that he was wearing his talith and no one else was. And I asked him why he's doing it. He says, and I thought it's the right thing to do. And I thought it would catch on in the shul. And I said, you know, it's not going to catch on. You know why? Because you're Rabbi Avi Weiss and uh, you're, you're, you're not exactly like everybody else. And most people aren't going to copy what you do. So, you know, you're just a little stuck. But I understood why, because he was, like I said, a committed person. And uh, despite the, the various arguments he had with my own Rosh Hashiva or my Rosh Hashiva's arguments with him, uh, this is something you can learn from it because here he was doing exactly as it says in the Shulchan Aruch. And uh, what are you going to do in the Bronx? It doesn't catch on. People don't wear their talith in the street. But here in Eretz Israel, uh, it's a very Jewish thing. Thank God you see Jews are more proud to wear their tzitzit, wear their tchelet, wear talit all day, wear their tefillin like they should. So hopefully it'll catch on. The Mishnah Burr himself basically implies this. He says there, We samach b'viyat Shabbat, achlar rabbi l'chabado, hein b'gufo, hein b'gavadav, hein b'achilah. It doesn't matter. It's, it's better. The more one uh, honors the Sabbath with his body or with his clothes. And as the Shulchan Aruch says, yes, sorry, the Mishnah Bura says, dress even nicer. And if the Talit certainly is another thing, there are people who put on tuxedos, a cummerbund, try to dress, they add a pin, they add a, they add a something on their lapel, a feather in their hat, whatever it is. The more you do to, uh, to uh, make the Sabbath clothes unique, to show how different they are and much more special they are from the weekday clothes, that's better. Of course, putting on a talith uh, would add to that. Some people wear a special tie. So we'll call that a night. We started a little bit late tonight, unless there's any questions. We'll stop this here. Uh, sometimes the uh, questions are, you know, are one, can one buy a uh, talith? Yes, one should. Uh, the colors of the stripes, really, like the Mishnah Burr says, it doesn't really matter. Uh, generally speaking, the the tzitzit that are not tchelish should be the color of the garment, the general color of the garment. So most of the talitoth you buy in, uh, out, out there are basically white, so the strings are white, and a few stripes don't take away from the whiteness of the general garment. And uh, as we know, the whiteness was a zecher le So uh, why are they black? They should be sort of bluish then, 
The answer is sometimes it's hard to make a blue dye. Uh, black dyes are easy to make. How do you make a black dye? Just burn something. Any ashes will make the, the color of black dye or black ink. So that's the convenience. But really, uh, the stripes don't matter. Uh, one fellow a few years ago told me that his father said that the stripe pattern on the talith is basically the barcode of one's prayers. And that's why, I don't know, some people like a certain pattern. Uh, there's the, the Chabadniks have a pattern that's popular based, I think, on the Rebbe's talis. Uh, the Yemenites have a certain pattern. None of those are really defined by halacha or necessary whatsoever. Uh, as for women, uh, we mentioned this, a woman could wear a talith. Uh, the, but the problem is it's a, a man's garment. A woman has the option to take on any commandments that she is not, uh, which, uh, which does not obligate her. It's a voluntary issue. Problem is, it just has to make sure that the garment she's wearing is a feminine garment, one that's appropriate for women. So I think Rabbi Moshe Feinstein says, you know, put a bow on it, pink stripes, whatever it may be, and then she can fill the commandment. Of course, the problem is, Nowadays, like Rav Schechter pointed out, uh, if one is among, let's say, for whatever reason, that's what the wrong people are doing, uh, just because the people who uh, have a problem with accepting the Torah as it is, but they also want to do certain commandments. They throw away certain commandments and certain halachot, but then they want to do it. So you have a little bit of a problem. From a strictly theoretical ideal strand standpoint, though, uh, women could fulfill this commandment. And perhaps, just like men should be doing so when they are praying and greeting the Sabbath, so too for women. But this thing really hasn't caught on. They don't make women's tully toth. We don't see women do this. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with that necessarily. It's just not the thing yet. And perhaps, I don't know, in a few years, this this will catch on and women will be doing that also. I don't know. I don't know where, where society will take us. Regarding to tully, uh, you have to have to have four strings in the front or does there have to have to be four string, one in the two string in the back and two string in the front? According to Rambam, we have to be four string in the rear to rear the front. The, the, a... the Rav has a sheer about this. The Shulchan Aruch mentions uh, two corners, two corners of the garment toward the front and two corners toward the back. But the Rav pointed out that, you know, uh, the Yemenite style is not like that. Uh, it doesn't seem that that's actually such a critical halacha. And uh, technically speaking, you could have all four, all four corners end up in the front. And that's the way many people have done it. That's the way the, you know, you can see pictures. That's classically the way it's been done. The scarf way, the conservative way, that's all entirely around the neck, that's a little bit problematic. It has to be around the body, and then the four corners go to the front. That, that uh, seems to be saying that's, that's possible. But, uh, yeah, they, they, but I could say you could reference that. I'll probably send you the link for the whole share about that, that topic. Okay, and that's right. it. we got to go. It's bye, bye. Thanks a lot. So we'll see you all next week. We'll have a new topic for next week. And uh, God willing, hope to meet everybody this Shabbat. Uh, be well. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And uh, may we merit to see uh, this and other commandments kept just as God commanded us. Be well. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Haim's message, and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org. If you are inspired by Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to get involved in Torah Eretz Yisrael activities in your local area, please fill out the relevant form by going to the link which appears on the screen.